We actually operate in many places where freight projects can't get approved and be built. But here in St. Louis, we're working together to grow the region's manufacturing and distribution center, bring those benefits and the value of freight and transportation to the region. Growth in the sectors that those in this room care about requires a strong industrial economy, which, quite frankly, hasn't been great over the past several years. Good news is rail volumes are growing again. 2007 is going to reflect that. We're seeing turnarounds in different parts of the industrial economy, as well as a continuing improvement in that consumer sector. But prior to December of 2026, 2016, the industrial sector saw 20 consecutive months of year-over-year -year declines. I'm just thinking about that, 20 consecutive months of year-over-year -year declines. I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about what we're seeing in the rail sector shortly and what opportunities and challenges it presents. Well, you know, if you're paying attention at all, you're getting a lot of buzz about the word infrastructure in our nation's capital. That's important to boosting industrial productivity and output. In fact, they're necessary. But one of the things we have to be careful about is how infra infrastructure spending has actually increased. Over the past couple decades, we've been moving away from the user pay system for funding highways that served us quite well. Taxpayers through the general fund infusions into the highway trust fund have been paying an increasing share of the maintenance and upkeep of the highway. Two of the five years of the current highway bill will be paid out as a general fund, quote, free to the users of the highways. This isn't only fiscally unsustainable, it results in a subsidy to commercial trucking to disadvantage railroads and the other users of the highways. I'm fond of saying the more you subsidize something, the more you'll get of it. More trucks means more wear and tear, which requires more maintenance investment. It's a cycle that won't stop. One double stack trend in intermodal train and consumer products removes more than 280 long haul freight trucks from the highway and the railroad invests private, not public dollars in the infrastructure. <laughs> As a country, we should want more freight on the highway, on the railroads, not less. We ask policymakers to consider how public policy decisions affect benefits that freight rail transportation provides, energy and environmental benefits, supply chain efficiencies, reduce highway congestion, and yes, maintenance costs. And I'll talk a little bit about these policy considerations, and I'm going to leave time for questions as well, so I hope you will have some. I like to refer to the U.S. supply chain as a weapon of mass competitiveness. It actually enables the U.S. worker to, to better compete in world markets and consistently delivers low-cost goods to the U.S. consumer at his or her convenience. And those in this room appreciate freight generates some of the best paying middle class jobs in the country, especially freight rail. But the annual state of logistics report in 2015 noted that the U.S. transportation network is at a turning point. Gaps in infrastructure and accelerated trends for speed will increasingly pressure a system not designed for the e-commerce driven last mile, last minute. Speeding the flow of logistics by investing in badly needed repairs and expanding infrastructure capacity at key choke points is critical as, lo as the logistics industry enter enters a new era characterized by disruptive forces where operational constraints like bottlenecks, permitting innovative issues, will evolve quickly from concerns going on into serious problems. Likewise, the rail industry is going through the transition that's the largest that I've seen in the 20 years that I've been in leadership at PNSF. It's being driven by shifts in the energy landscape our customers' ever-changing supply chains, our competitors, and yes, public policy, such as how our nation's highway infrastructure is funded and how regulation will permit railroads to innovate. The railroad industry must continue to increase its efficiency to remain competitive. So let's take a brief look at the rail sector's market. I think you'll find it instructive as well. We're seeing a fundamental shift away from coal as a resource for generation, generating electricity in the U.S. In 2008, the peak year for U.S. rail coal traffic, Class 1 railroads originated 7.7 million carloads of coal. Coal carloads in 2016 were about 4 million fewer than in 2008, and we expect our coal volumes to continue to decline overall. Industry coal volumes has gone from about 25% of rail revenues to just about 15% today. Big decrease. Last year, our industrial products volumes were down overall about 8% due mainly to petroleum-related declines and a mobile shift more to pipelines. Frac sand and plastics were the real bright spots of this business. 
while we're not seeing a, a ramp up in rig counts, we are starting to see increasing demand for sand as well as requiring more sand to keep pumping. Growth in the consumer products, which is our BNSF's largest business unit, representing more than 50% of all of our units, was modest in 2016, up only slightly this year. International volumes from the West Coast ports were down by more than 60,000 units last year, and we'll continue to face some headwinds there. Domestic intermobile is growing slowly. The trucks, which our customers and our competition have benefited from consistently low prices of fuel and truck overcapacity. However, in the long run, we believe domestic intermodal remains our largest potential area of growth, converting trucks to rail. It's also areas like where St. Louis that has good, good growth potential. As population increases, more people need to move more stuff and will rely on the supply chain to deliver it. On the bright side, 2016, our ag products volumes was up about 6% year over year. In late spring, it became clear that Brazil's corn crop wasn't going to be great and there was greater demand for U.S. crops. BNSF quickly pivoted to bring more grain hoppers into our grain fleet to handle these stronger volumes. The outlook this year, of course, will depend on the harvest in the U.S., our foreign competition, and currency values. 2017 has shown some modest improvements in volumes. Of the 22 business units that we measure, 12 of them actually show year-over-year -year improvement. Nevertheless, to maintain our position our, for our network, for opportunities and improve safety and efficiency, efficiently. Efficiency, the NSF's invested over $55 billion since the year 2001. This year alone, our capital program will be about $3.4 billion. The largest component of that will be a little over a couple billion dollars in overall maintenance infrastructure.